So I'm Giuseppe. Uh, this is my friend and colleague, uh, Robin. Um, so we, we proposed this panel on the basis of a book that I published um, recently uh, with we, we Rutledge. Here, this is, this is the one. Um, and I think some of the, um, some of the, uh, some of the content in this book actually addresses, um, in many respects, all the discussion that may, uh, all the presenters have done today. To give you a little background, uh, the the premises of this book um, uh, are, lie on a fundamental question, at least for me, which was what is digital art? To put it bluntly, like, is there, an, is there a digital art? Or, as many of you have said today, we're just doing art about the digital. Now, if we do art about the digital, I think we can carry on and talk about what we do and call it art. But this does not seem to be the reality, at least in my eyes. No, there is a, a plethora of terminology, interactive art, computer art, digital art. It's, it's, it's a lot. So I, I kind of start questioning myself, all right, assuming that there is a digital art, what, what that might be. There are differences in between uh, digital and art, and I, I, I ground this, this kind of uh, um, tension in a tension between arts and sciences. So now for this panel, what we are planning to do is break, it, break these hours in three parts. I present something, Robin presents something, and then we open up the discussion. There will be three topics. The first one is about etymolo etymology. What is digital? Not what it is digital art, what is digital? The other one is two key terms that appears in my book. One is called epistem epistemological optimism, and the third one, the third part of the book, uh, sorry, the, 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 the talk will be about output essentialism. We will introduce these ideas and see how you feel about that. Um, so to start off, um, to give you just a sense of uh, the kind of Babel's tower in which we all live. I mean, many of you come from digital humanities. Many of you are, uh, are practitioners. Here is a kind of, a, I want to just read an, ex an excerpt of, from the book. Um, so to give you an idea, um, the term, uh, sorry, uh, there is, I argue, little clarity coming to its terminology, the digital art, because terms are created not on the premises of an etymological study that points at their essence, but rather to situate a set of practices within a specific tradition. The term digital performance, for example, highlight ties with the field of theater and performance studies. The term new media art claims a historical lineage with the early 20th century avant-garde. Digital art, which is often used interchangeably with new media art, differs from it by placing greater emphasis on the novelties brought about by the technical medium, and hence it expands the set of practical and theoretical challenges in new media uh, discourse. And here I'm quoting Simonowski. More recently, the term post-digital has come to designate practices for which the specificity of the media, analog or digital, is secondary, if of any importance at all, the the uh, to the conceptual basis of an artwork. Now, this is actually one of the things that really pushed my uh, <laughs> effort to write something. I, at one point, I said, how on earth have we come to talk about post-digital if we even haven't agreed on what digital is? What, what are you post about? So that, that stimulated a lot of thought. Where, definition are often, uh, where, where, sorry, where definitions are offered on the basis of philosophical reasoning, the matter does not get any clearer. Lopez, in a book that may have pleased more philosopher than media theorist and practitioner, defined computer art as that set of works that exploits the, techno I'm quoting here, 
exploit the, technolo the technology of computing in order to achieve interactivity, end quote. This is hardly a fortunate choice in terminology, if only for the simple reason that early art experiments with computer, historically labeled as computer art, were not interactive at all, or you, or you have to just expand the understanding of interactivity to anything, and therefore then it means nothing. Yet it may be argued that it all depends on what one means by the word interactive. Katja uh, Kwast, uh, Wastek, for example, would label interactive art any kind of artwork in which both active participant or passive observation by human are at play. However, this definition weakens so greatly the boundaries between analog and digital mediation that, that, that one would be inclined to ask why bother at all with a title such as aesthetic of interaction in digital arts. I'm a bit harsh here, but I, I felt I had to. <laughs> <laughs> um, the focus in interaction and hence on those who interact, namely performance or audience, early st uh, easily stirred the conversation towards the consideration of the body, its disembodiment or embodiment, space, time, and soon we are at the door of performance art studies. Saltz, for example, supports the continuity between interactive art and performance art, but also argues that not all kinds of participatory interactions are performative, while only those for which interaction itself becomes an aesthetic object are. And so on and so on. I mean, here it continues with many examples borrowed from, uh, a, a, it's a, almost a literature review. But the, the point here is that there's total disagreement on what digital is. So I'll, I'll give my definition of digital, okay? And, and then I'll let uh, Robin respond. Um, now, many, for example, would think that digital is at zeros and one, right? That's the kind of idea not many people have. Well, Believe me, that's not the case. Uh, a colleague of mine at uh, University of Limerick uh, works on ternary computers. So computers that work on a logic that is based on 0, 1, and 2. So it's not about being binary. It's not about being 0 and 1. This is, this is not the case. Now, the, of, the, 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 the definition you know, that we seem to implicitly accept or have accepted is the one Digital as con uh, um, discrete and uh, analog as continuous, right? Now, this kind of definition uh, comes actually from a philosophical debate, a very small, mostly unknown philosophical debate, by Goodman and Lewis. And to give you an idea of the differences that they give, again, sorry, uh, I hope you don't mind if I read bits of it. Can you understand my accent? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so, Goodman and Lewis are the first philosophers to have reasoned on digital systems by contrasting them, as many would do today, with analog ones. Goodman argued that perhaps the best course, uh, uh, sorry, argued that, quote, perhaps the best course is to try to dissociate analog and digital from analog, analogy and digits, and distinguish them in terms of density and differentiation, end quote. The simplified version of such a dichotomy is what we all refer today to today as discrete and continuous, meaning that representation is syntactically and semantically undifferentiated in analog system, hence dense and continuous, and syntactically and semantically differentiated in a digital system, hence discrete. Lewis, who responded to, Go to Goodman, replied that an analog system can be syntactically and semantically differentiated too. And here a simple example is that, to put it simply, like an analog system could be discrete. Punch cards are discrete. Or if you are to, see, to put a sequence of punch cards, the sequence of you actually inserting, waiting the output, there is a gap, you input another one. So that distinction doesn't hold, and that's the kind of point that Lewis is making to Goodman. And many computers, like the Z1, uh, Z1 and Model K, were actually analog system working in, in that process. So they could, be, they could be described as digital computer, despite being presented in the literature as analog. Lewis then suggested a differentiation based on the modes of representation. Accordingly, analog systems represent number by using digits describing physical quantities, for example, ohms and resistors, 
digital system, on the contrary, represent numbers by separating token from the value. And therefore, require more digits. Multi-digital, that's what he called it, Lewis. Now, Lewis, Lewis' theory or response wasn't that clear, hence, the, hence Goodman actually won the debate. And so people cut the, the, cut the crap <laughs> and said, okay, Goodman is right, and we go with Goodman. Discrete and continuous, that is, and we move on. Now, in, the, the, it, the thing is problematic, okay? Because even in Lewis, there is a problem of what you mean. Like, I mean, you can see LED being switched on and off, two LED, one uh, being off and therefore zero, and the other one, one being zero. But that doesn't mean that you are reading them as numbers, zero and one, or one and zero. Or somebody comes in and say, it's actually 10, who tells you that you have to read in binary. Okay, so there is always, an, it's, it's, um, it's not coherent logically to interpret that, uh, neither. Now, my, my thesis, simple, uh, probably simple, my definition is probably um, uncontroversial uh, to many extents. But um, I jump to the part of the definition and let Robin answer. Um, the idea is that basically digital, for, um, digital means only to discretize a flow of electrons in time. So as to count things, one wants to give a number two. We record our voice, that's what we're doing. We are counting. My sound waves will be counted. We want to generate a synthesizer, a digital synthesizing sound or a digital image. Doesn't mean that it has to, be, has to have a counterpart in the physical world. We can create digital image ex nihilo on the computer. We count them first. Everything lies on a count. But here is a problem for digital artists, at least a problem I felt. For digital art practitioners, this means something terrible, namely that anything we do is a count, including all of our action through it. So that at the end of a journey that moves from input to output, we come out not recognizing ourselves anymore because we are not numbers. I'll leave it to Robin. Okay, well, um, I, I'm going to take an interesting approach. I'm not necessarily going to, I'm, I'm going to address the same topics, but not in a dialectic, because it so happens that we share an office wall on the campus, and I want to stay on really good terms with my colleagues. So um, I, I've, I've chosen to address things in a different way, but I will, I will work with this idea, and we're using such amazingly crude technology here, I love it, um, showing images in a defunct web browser is uh, kind of perfect for me. But um, so I'm going to work with this distinction between continuous and discrete, which I think is a problematic, but it's something that we can probably work with. And I'm, I'm going to do it on the basis of digital audio just for several reasons. First of all, it's 35 years something since the compact disc was uh, introduced into the market. And that consumer device was the first device that introduced digital media consumption to the general public. Um, so I'm going to focus on digital audio, but that's not to say the arguments apply only to audio. It's just I will use those as easy, simple exemplars. And also because my, my training was in audio engineering, which occurred right on the cusp of digital as it was coming into play. So it was sort of a very interesting time for me personally. And um, it's still the case that many music listeners and even music producers remain fundamentally anxious about digital audio. And in the popular press and online and forums and so on, um, it's commonly stated you know, that analog is musical, whereas digital is harsh and cold and so on. And I found a wonderful example of this from the artist Neil Young, whom you may know as folk musician turned rock musician turned crusty old white dude, <laughs> which I'm partially on my way there myself. <laughs> and there's two quotes from his biography, which are fantastic. Did you ever go in a shower and turn it on? I'm not gonna do his voice, that was done very well earlier. <laughs> 
I felt like, felt like I was in the room with the guy. Anyway, and have it come out tiny little ice cubes. That's the difference between CDs and the real thing, water and ice. And even better, the second quote, nobody realized digital wasn't as good as analog because it wasn't an obvious problem. It was more obvious after you listened a while. The first time, hey, no hiss, wow, great. You didn't realize there was no sound until a little while later. So that's a good jumping off point, I think. Um, it makes two claims that are typical of this position. The first, um, and I'm, I'm gonna have to read a little bit here so I stay on track, otherwise I'll talk for an hour. Uh, the first contrasts the laminar flow of an ideal analog system, which actually never really exists, there's always turbulence in such a system, but nonetheless, it contrasts that with the discontinuities and the hard, solid, cubic uh, form of the digital. And secondly, it equates um, digital with cold temperatures, which is still done. Something I won't really explore, but there's an interesting somatic thing there that someone could get into at some point. Um, so the, the claim that there's no sound on CDs seems a little ridiculous, but I think Neil Young got to the heart of it in a strange way, because he's talking about the discontinuities, the gaps between those zeros and ones that we can only imagine are there. So one of the things I want to make clear is that this is a non-phenomenological argument that's made, because we don't experience digital ever. Um, as soon as digital audio is played back through a speaker system, it's analog again, it's pressure waves in the air. We don't ever hear the digital, we don't ever see the digital, it's not something we can experience. It's a non-phenomenological effect, it's epistemological. It's, we have the knowledge it's there, and that causes us this anxiety which in the chapter I wrote in German, unfortunately, I called digital angst, because angst is a good word to have published in a German book. They understand <laughs> angst. Okay. So, I'm gonna put, for the first time ever, Neil Young and Jean Baudrillard in slides one after the other. And Baudrillard, in, in his book, The Perfect Crime, which is one of his more interesting books, not all of his books are interesting, uh, said many things, and this is oversimplifying, but you are never entirely there at the particular moment. Integral presence is only ever virtual. Of course, he was famous for using the word virtual to mean just about anything he wanted to in the given passage. But um, this is, in some ways, a very uh, phenomenological statement about existence and identity, that we exist from moment to moment, and our lives are made up of the repetition of these moments and the difference between them, Deleuze, as referenced in a talk this morning. So um, this is actually getting at the same problem, but from a totally different perspective. So, um, and also in, in my colleague's uh, book, he says the inevitable result of any discretization, or if that's how you say that word, process, is that in between counts there will always be an unfilled gap or void. So it is sort of this, this void that is an issue for us. Um, and this void occurs in all sorts of unexpected places, not necessarily in the digital entirely. Like there's this strange world somewhere between the analog and the digital that I think you were actually hinting at a moment ago in terms of how um, we can't so easily say that one is discrete and one is continuous. So an example I sometimes use is timbre. Where is timbre? Here's timbre. Um, so um, when we look at sound waves on a computer, we sometimes look at them as if they're waves, which they aren't also, and we sometimes look at them with a spectrogram or spectrograph. And the idea here is that timbre is that special quality that distinguishes instruments and sounds from each other. So same volume, same amplitude, same frequency or pitch, depending on which way you want to look at it, but they still sound different. They sound different because of the spectral content that we're hearing at every moment and how that changes over time. So when we come to represent that, we need to analyze the sound in a small time window and determine what frequencies are there. And we get a plot like this, or sometimes it's more colorful. I think I deliberately made this cyan because cyan's my favorite non-color. Um, so 
there's an issue here, because in order to get more and more accurate views of the timbre, you have to make the window smaller and smaller. But it's very strange we would choose to do this, because we're measuring frequency over time. And frequency itself is the sound vibrating in time. So our, normally, when you graph two things, you have to make sure that you have independent variables. But these are not independent variables. So the problem is that if you make the, the window too small, you actually can't measure certain sound waves. I think you, you, know, you become less accurate in the lower frequencies first. You can't actually, it's like some rooms are too small to support low frequencies. The wave is literally meters long and can't exist in that room, so you can never get big bass sounds out of that room. It's kind of a similar analogous problem. So when you make this, uh, the fre frequency range, sorry, not the frequency range, the window, the time window, shorter and shorter, you end up with what's called an impulse, which essentially is just a blast of noise. And indeed, you can reconstitute sounds from small blasts of noise on the computer if you do so using particular techniques. So that little blast of noise, the impulse, is used as a sonic probe, for example, to analyze the acoustics of this room. If I wanted to measure the acoustics of the room, the reverberation time and other properties, I would put a small burst of noise, an impulse, this little tiny digital, <laughs> in quotes, blip of sound that's not really a sound into the room in order to activate the room and learn something about it. So I know that it's, it's not, um, strictly speaking, the same thing. But to me, that impulse is a, is a sonic probe that has a lot of the qualities of the digital as well, in that in, on its own, it is fairly meaningless. But it can be used to activate a space to create meaning that we can phenomenologically comprehend. And I'm going to leave it there. And I hope that in the comments we get, you can help me through some of my problems with this argument still, which is still developing. So do you feel like you want to respond, interject? Do, do you see this, the two sides of the debate? <laughs> do you see how we contrast in, 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 in the ideas? Well, it was just what you were saying earlier about um, you know, the discrete and the continuous. You know, like, you, know we, you could say, for instance, that our our interpretation of our perceptions is continuous in the sense that we're living beings, but our perceptions are discrete, you know, that we perceive one thing at a time and we process them one, one at a time. You know, so like, you know, I was just thinking to myself, you know, how would you, you know, sort of apply that to concepts of digital and analog? Because, I mean, basically analog is kind of a, you know, a parallelism, you know, it's sort of um you know, one thing is similar to another, and you know that. You know what I mean. So I was trying to try to say in my like, I heard both what you said, but I'm not sure exactly what your argument is. But that's what was going through my mind in a way that, you know, like that our perceptions are discrete, and that you know continuous time of our being is what's the continuous variable. You know. So I yeah. don't know if I don't know if you can respond to that. Maybe I'll, I'll oversimplify uh, the. And perhaps I will be wrong, and now Robin is going to kill me for that. But I, I think uh, the, 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 the two sides of the debate in this case between me and Robin is for the fact that Robin basically says, OK, maybe we are, there's no need to be so anxious about this distinction between analog and digital. OK, let's chill out. After all, we could have countless examples on how our everyday life is a digital affair. And therefore, this, this, this thing's nullifying itself. And so we could say, are we all digital? And so digital art is part of digital reality. Or because there is a digital reality, then anyway, we move into the analog domain. And th there's no collision there, to a certain extent. What I'm saying instead <coughs> is, well, hold on a second. I have no problem in understanding reality as analog. And I think we understand reality analogically, in the sense we don't put a count on our experience. If I see this screen, this screen is a, digital, is a projection of a digital image. Do I have a problem with that? No. 
uh, it's part of my reality, of the reality we all experience, and that could be not placed into account, and we still experience, right? And the same when I uh, appreciate or interact with an art or a digital artwork, okay? And that's not a problem. I have no issues with that, okay? And I think much of the philosophical literature, media art literature, takes that perspective. I'm saying, hold on a second, from the from the perspective of the digital art practitioner, not, not the viewer or somebody that is experiencing artwork, there's a problem there. The problem is that now everything I do, despite I know for a fact that it's me, if I draw something here now on the laptop, right, and do a, a line like this in paint, right, I know that it's me. You know that it's me just because <laughs> you see me, like, okay, but uh, if, if we put a cart in here, you wouldn't know whether it's me or Robin doing the same gesture. And that's because I say, well, anything we do and we translate into a computer, into a, any digital device, automatically loses the trace of, my, of myself. I get lost because now anything, any digital, digitized trace, because digital, I name it as a kind of anything that you wish to put a count on, becomes a number. Now, at this point I say, either we accept we're going to be in numbers, like people in jail, right? Or we have to abandon subjectivity, individuality in arts, and therefore we become, I don't know, I'm <coughs> exaggerating here, okay, I'll just to put it for a stress, priests to the altar of God technology, you know, like where the importance is technology. And anything we do, it doesn't matter who does it, we, we are subservient to uh, the service of this God. Where is India? So, yeah, sorry. I don't even know if it's a debate like this. It's more like talking around similar concepts in different ways. And a lot of it is coming to think about our engagement with technology and thinking about how we relate to it. Um, Robin, your point about how uh, the digital is non phenomenological, as in we experience it as an analog. It's always analog through sound or vision, those are not digital processes. And then thinking here about the impact of the discretization of how, you know, turning into numbers and counting. And so I do think that there is a kind of common ground in thinking about that relationship between our human use with technology. And here, though, this, though, I do think is what does digital technology add that is different from technology, more generally speaking? I get it's the question. Like I'm thinking of philosophers like Bernard Stiegler, hmm. who does not. Um, he talks a lot about how you know technology. We can think of human technology coevolution going back to you know flint tools, um, the externalization of memory. But for instance, with digital technologies, it's the speed of the processing, the ability to kind of externalize more and more memories, to process it more and more quickly, to um, and that in turn impacts our human relations. Um, then thinking about the systems and how they come back to us. Um, I know I'm getting rambly now, but you've been asking all day about the, how to define the digital. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because every answer has been slightly different mm -hmm. within that context. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, it's, it's um, what is it, why do we still use the term? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I often ask. Because if the work is not about the digital, then why put that word in? Unless it forms a unique distinction, you know? Like, I teach digital video, but I make sure that I also have a couple classes on analog video where I show how the circuits work. And there, you need to make a distinction. The technologies are different, the inputs are different, the outputs are different. And generally, the students have never seen analog video, so they're freaked out, especially because it's a synthesizer I have that's synthesizing stuff ex nihilo, as was said. So sometimes the terms are necessary, but quite often we just stick it in there to make a big acronym. I beg your pardon. <laughs> You're talking about the extension of the intelligence of the individual using the digital tool, and therefore it, that added to the, uh, the time element. So there you have an enhanced human, an enhanced intelligence, um, when you add the tool to the actual uh, flexibility of the human condition. Yeah, for me, that, for me, like, I'm a big fan of Merleau-Ponty, you know, his brand of phenomenology. And he made very clear 
coming from Heidegger, you know, the fact that our, our tools are extensions of ourselves, that then Marshall McLuhan picked up on that and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and that gets into the whole cyborg theories and so on. And I, I think it's very true. Sometimes it's very hard to determine where we end and our tools begin. Like, for example, my eyeglasses is a good example, um, which, which just become a part of how I have to see the world, because without them, I'm, I'm, I actually don't see, apparently, I don't see three dimensions. I think I do, but the tests tell me I don't. See, there's an interesting problem, too. So, but yeah, I think, I think, and in simple examples, so I think Merleau-Ponty uses the example of someone with a cane who gets so used to using the cane walking and tapping out their surroundings, it becomes part of their continuous experience of the world, so they no longer think about the cane, which is not that dissimilar from our use of the hand, which he also gives the example of one hand touching another, and how one hand is doing the touching and the other is receiving the touching, but we do not actually experience it as a discrete phenomenon. We don't. We, we, which gets back to the previous question. We actually experience the world as an integral phenomenon. And it's only through rationalization we do things like break it up into the five senses, which of course is a fiction from 2,000 years ago. So, I mean, we have 18, 20, 30 senses, like, you know, how many do you want to name? And so we experience the world integrally. And it's only when we have to sort of theorize about it in certain ways it becomes convenient to divide that up. Uh, as, like, as a sound artist, I find it very difficult to consider that we only listen with our ears, for example, because it's, it's very hard now for me to just say that it's, it's our ear. But I would answer to that, okay? My counterpoint would be this, um, talking about sound. Um, and we make the distinction between, uh, let's, let's take two different synthesizers. One analog synthesizer, actually two, a couple of uh, analog synthesizers, and two digital synthesizers, right? Now, the, analog, the problem that in the early days with synthesizers was that uh, they couldn't, different brands couldn't talk to each other, okay? But in analog synthesizer, because what, what, these, what these tools are doing is just moving a current flow, right? Uh, and like, it's like uh, having, I don't know, a river and li different dams, right? Even if they don't, are not made to talk to each other, something will sound out of the two if you patch them. And you might not be able to predict it, but because there is a current flow, something, chances something happens are there. Now, try to do the same thing with two digital synthesizer. Generally, we have to use protocols for doing that, right? You patch them, try to send something. There are no chances if that the other device is not programmed to receive messages, digital bits, digital count, digital <laughs> messages. There are no way that that device will respond. It will never. I mean, it might respond and do a blip at one point if something happens on the mains, but that's another affair. There's no message there happening. That I think this is very important. This is an example which terrifies me as when I, in my little experience as a practitioner, because now I see that this flow, no, that of the reality in which I speak, is continuously interrupted, and there is a number of places in anything I do, no matter if I do uh, press N A on the keyboard or in digital piano. Like, now there is not that infinite, uh, non-count, no, let's not talk about infinite and finite, finite system, but non-countable <laughs> reality, to use counter terminology, okay? Uh, non-count, uh, non-count, it would be, to, avo to avoid it, to non-countable reality, okay? Um, and I think that that's, for me, that for me, that's a, a huge problem, because I cannot, I cannot tell, I, 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 or at least I'm not ready to, to have all my gestures be numerically uh, inscribed. Yes. I, yes. I'm curious, like, if yeah. the two of you had to guess whose side I was going to fall on, who do you think it would be? <laughs> no. Um, do you know, something keeps coming up for me. Carrie works with us in UL. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm on the She's other the side. Other. I'm the other wall. <laughs> 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 Um, no, the, something keeps coming up for me, and I might be 
giving a digression here, so you can ignore me if that's the case. But um, you know, when I, it, it's it's kind of an ontological discussion, but uh, it, you know, a lot of music theory in the 20th century was based on the score, mm -hmm. to the point where a music theorist named Nicholas Cook said, you know, we've reified the score now. We have this objectified note, this idealist note, and we're doing all this analysis on the score, but the piece is not the score. The piece is what happens when it's performed in a hall. And so we need to now readjust how we are analyzing music based on the experience. And this became all that much more important when uh, music moved away from the score and became electronic. It, whether digital or analog, but electronic and no longer relied on the score. And the reason this is coming up for me is because the traditional Western music score is an encoding in the same way that scores in other cultures are encoding as well with a different protocol, to use your word, right? So could you hand a uh, gamelan score to an untrained Western performer and have them play it correctly? No, because they're not speaking the same protocol. But the metaphor is there because we shouldn't be looking at this art as the fact that it's encoded by numbers. We shouldn't be looking at its score. We should be looking at it as how do we perceive it when it's presented to us. And, and so this is why I think I, you know, I am falling, believe it or not, on, on Robin's side a little bit in that it's... Strange. I, I know, right? They're like, they're like what? But I, what I would I'll disagree. Take what I can get. <laughs> but I would disagree that it's an analog experience. I think that's setting up a, a false dichotomy. I think, um, I think instead, what maybe rather than worrying about what is digital and analog, is 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 to focus on the experience of the art. And and in some ways, there are forms of digital art that are very much like music because in in some sense, they are intangible until they're presented, right? So a digital image isn't there until it's projected on the screen. A symphony doesn't exist until there's an orchestra performing it. And maybe, you know, me being the, <laughs> the only one who doesn't do visual arts in the room, but maybe there's something here to be taken away from how people go about um, experiencing, analyzing, and talking about the um, musical forms that don't exist except either as an encoded sheet or as the subjective experience. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, I think that's, yeah. That's, it, <laughs> it, it, what it brings up, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what it brings up is the idea of code, which has come up a few times already today. And it brings up what? Code. Yeah, code, uh, code now, standing in for something, because in the same way a, a computer program existing as pure code is both useless, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way, and incomplete. It is just, a, it's just the algorithm for something, for an output that, that may or may not be uh, possible to make tangible. Like for years, I kept a, a stack of punch cards from a Fortran 77 program I wrote when I was 16, because it was like the first program I ever wrote. And um, at some point, I lost it, or I decided not to carry them around. Then they became worth lots of money each. Anyway, and, and you know, a stack of punch cards is absolutely meaningless without the other technological infrastructure to manifest what actually was just an image. It just printed out an image on paper uh, using black ink. That's it, no shades of black, because that's all we had was a line printer. But. Um, I'm not going anywhere with that, but it's a similar, it, it is a direct comparison with the score, I think. Absolutely. And I, I would agree. Um, I would agree. Uh, and again, this is, this is I think, uh, the, the biggest difficulty I have in explaining my perspective is this. Again, I can take your example of the score. And yes, without any doubts. <laughs> When we perform it, when, when we attend the performance, even from the performer's perspective, perhaps that's the only es escape safety route also for digital artists, the actual live events, no? like, so that testify to your actions. Otherwise, your action will be anonymous. They could be literally anonymous because transferred, transformed into account. But even to the example of the music, and we can translate it with Pollock. No, like, okay, dripping technique, 
Okay? I, we can write in two seconds, actually there are tons of examples online that you can do Pollux dripping technique not to do that kind of similar style painting. 30 line of code, that's it, done. But the, do we know who has done? No, who has done that, right? It's, uh, the, there is a problem, so for, if we take art as an experience, as an event, absolutely. But taking the example of, of music, right? Um, I play one note on the piano. This is, this is maybe, that's the perspective, maybe to clarify my perspective, I'll give you a short uh, autobiographical note. I was trained as a classical guitarist, okay? So I've, I was there remembering my studies where eight hours a day, sitting down, don't, don't, I develop your, my personal touch. I don't know, I think translating in English as well, tocco, right? One way, so basically the way I'm plucking the strings, it will become mine and only mine, so that if I play two notes, 90% of the time you would say, oh, that's Giuseppe, no question. That's Glenn Gould playing back, no question. We can recognize that. Now, if I do the same exercise with a digital piano, for example, no, instead, of the or instead of the normal, uh, normal time, do I have the possibility to explore that infinite, because that word, my note on a piano, I can stay there two million hours, and I can, or on the, on the guitar, especially in the guitar, because there is also the, the density of my finger, of my nails, the humidity of the room, whatever, you name it. It's non-countable reality. By playing the same thing, doing the same thing with a digital instrument, I'm cutting out all of that. And now, suddenly, I have only 128 possibilities. MIDI, no? the velocity called. It's not, true. it's not true, though, even in, even in a factual level, it's not true. There's very expressive digital instruments. Well, okay, so, okay. I, I may, maybe MIDI is outdated and there is others. Sorry, but that's the kind of difference I see. It's still <coughs> numerically finite, countable. Sorry, yeah. Uh, thank you, this is really interesting. Um, and uh, it seems to me that it, Giuseppe, is it? Giuseppe, Your yeah, point right. uh, seems to be more connected with the increasing way in which uh, metrics are used and measurement has become part of our lives. So if I think of something like a musical score or written music or a mathematical equation, I as a human being can, if I'm that way, if trained well enough, imagine that sound and it, it sort of translates into uh, something visual perhaps for mm -hmm. me as a mathematician, but not machine code, let's say, mm -hmm. something like C++, I can probably work out what that would do and not um, the jacquard looms sort of punch cards. I'm not going to understand what mm -hmm. kind of silk woven materials that's going to make. But, but there was a time in the 90s when your, your pheno phenomenological point um, didn't quite hold. You could see uh, the pixels. Um, the resolutions were low. And likewise with sound, um, you could tell the difference between early um, formats and analog records, let's say. Um, so that's when digital art emerged as an idea. And people like Lev Manovich began to write very interestingly about uh, and dismissing a lot of the, the myths to do with digital. Mm -hmm. But hasn't digital come, I mean, to me, digital art, as it happens, is, is reason, as I sort of said when I opened up, potentially it's an old and, and easy to dismiss and, and meaningless term, but it's emerged as a social system um, over a period of 20 or 30 years, and now it's come to encapsulate other things. And that's kind of outside the realms of what you're both talking about. Mm -hmm. um, but aren't you just talking about the increased uh, metricization of the world? So I go to my daughter's um, parent-teacher meeting, and I'm presented with an array of data. <laughs> I get no sense of whether she's happy or right. interested in chemistry or art uh, or how she's getting on socially from this discussion. And the teacher is overworked, of course, so they don't either. But I've got, some, I've got a, a, a matrix. <laughs> um, yeah. is, isn't that what you're talking about, as opposed yeah. to a kind of digital? It's, it's the same. Yes, it's, it's very related. Like, uh, my, my, my problem is, now, may, maybe, maybe, the, maybe my premises is wrong, and you can tell me you think differently, but I, I think like the arts 
outside, but is similar to the, to the example of teacher, uh, teachers' parents meeting. Like, so, yeah, are we numbers or, or, or we're not, right? Now, I think of art as a very subjectivizing practice, no? where I need to find my identity to leave a trace in this world. And I want to make sure that that trace is mine. Do numbers allow that? Do account allow that? I okay. mean, two plus two belongs to me as it belongs to all of you. I'm oversimplifying. But that's, that's the idea. So this, the same, like, I mean, that the fact that the teacher, the Excel sheet, uh, maybe there are 2,000 other kids that have the same Excel sheet. What, what differentiate that <laughs> between uh, your daughter and 2,000 more students? Um, that's the, that's the, that's the. Well, let, yeah. uh, can I? I, I want to say, <coughs> oh. if it, <coughs> sorry. I just want to say one quick thing. Um, you know, I, I don't know where this discussion will be going, but I have a feeling it will be going towards intellectual property rights, really, you know, because mm. as you said, if you have your own individual style, well, then you're one in nine, nine billion, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you have something, you know, recorded in a, a metric sense, and it's your intellectual property right, then, you know, that's in you know, a whole different numbers game. So I don't know if the conversation will go in that direction, but it, I was just thinking that that's maybe a it's different... It's definitely a path, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I just want to respond in a, in a different way to this sort of... Again, coming back to this, this sort of angst we feel that we are, we are analog and this alien digital thing with these gaps in it is, is somehow not complete enough for us. Because, I mean, earlier I had the picture of the ear. It's probably here still somewhere. I don't know, I've got to go through tabs in a browser to find pictures. Uh, and the ear is, or any of our sense organs, let's just use the ear because I'm quite familiar with it. Um, I mean, the outer and the middle part of the ear work in what we would call analog processes. So a sound pressure wave comes and vibrates the tympanum, which then vibrates three little bones in the middle ear, which act as a little amplifier and a little protection mechanism. And then it gets to the, the um, uh, cochlea, which is full of fluid. So now we have a pressure wave in fluid. So this pressure wave has been in at least three different materials already, each time transposed from one to the other. But then there is this strange and magical process that we still don't really have much understanding about, where the stereocilia, those little hairs inside the fluid, pick up different frequencies of sound. And there's two sets of these, but the one set that's actually receiving the sound is a discrete number of cells, no more than 20,000, which pick up sound in particular frequency ranges, so some specialize in the bass and the middle bass and so on. And those create, through their movement, they trigger chemical reactions, potassium and you know, how the nerves work, which we often idealize as kind of an electrical flow, but it isn't. It's a chemical flow, a chain of one thing to the next. Those are discrete processes. We don't have an infinite number of hair cells listening. And in fact, it's quite magical how we can hear everything we do. It doesn't actually make any sense, <laughs> as far as we know. There's a huge complex of different ganglia going up before you even get to the brain with all sorts of processes going on, including nerve impulses going back to the ear, acting as feedback mechanisms. And you know, one of the miracles of the senses is that we can actually coordinate. We look at Giuseppe, and he says something, and we see and hear it coming from his mouth at the same time, even though the nerve impulses take different lengths of time to get to the brain. So our brain is synthesizing the world for us in particular ways that the more you look at them, the less natural they appear. You know, the people but, who investigate the, this, it, it gets very strange. For example, we can hear sounds instantaneously to, they appear instantaneous when the, all those processes ha, all have finite times they take to work. Our brain actually maps back in time the sounds we hear and presumably the, the, the light we see, although sound, it's easier to study because sound waves are slow, etc. Uh, so 
How, can, can, it, I, yeah. can I reply to that? Okay, but I follow that, but the, the logical conclusion of that, if we are to count our, if we are to take the audio domain, the way we perceive audio, just to the number of cells we, that fires, that the logical conclusion of that will be that eventually we all hear the same thing at the same time, uh, not at the same time, so in the same way, right? No, but we, that, doesn't, that doesn't follow. <laughs> that would only follow if every ear worked identically to every other. That's not exactly. part of the claim. The, the ah, claim okay. is only that it exactly. has this, so, exactly. this structure to it. Exactly. So in order to avoid that kind of stuff, the, the, the thing I'm stressing is to move away from this criticization, right? And make a difference between what is countable and what is not countable. Or it doesn't, it, in order to exist, in not, it does not need to be counted. I'll give you another example. One sec. I think, um, I'll give you another example. Dams, right? I was mentioning before. I can't remember why. I, I, I wrote it in the book, this example, but I, I was thinking something. Anyway, a dam. A dam, no, in Limerick we have a dam, a beautiful dam, actually. Uh, in Arna Crucia is 80 meters tall. Like, I mean, it takes an hour to go down. Anyway, beautiful. So a dam, there is a river, there is the water flow, and then at one point, some year, something, it rains a lot, the paths will overflow, whatever that is, blah, blah, blah. We know life, right? <laughs> it happens, we can't predict it. Now, I want to do a digital dam. Now, that digital dam would not exist at all if we do not start counting. Not discretizing, I don't care about discretizing at this end, counting. So, if you count, you count uh, the, the river, it's a number. If you don't devise a way of counting overflow, that river will not overflow, no matter what you do. I mean, I'm talking, if you do 3D simulation, you may have an idea of what I'm meaning here. You have to take to account to everything, right, into the system. Anything that is not being counted, thought of, and then translated into account will not be part of the 3D virtual world. Suddenly, I threw coffee or set on fire my computer, something I'll do very soon for the summer, <laughs> and all the digital worlds will disappear. It, it vanishes. Certainly the dam in Limerick doesn't need to be counted to exist. It's there. Right? Whether I'm there, whether you're counting it, I'm counting it, the river couldn't care less. That's the kind of uh, my answer. Okay, sorry, there was a... Uh, yeah, just... Yeah, sorry. Um, is your problem then with the digital one of authenticity? Also, yeah. So also, in yeah. what sense? I mean, do you think that by making digital work, you're basically making work that has no, no longer has your personality imprinted on it because it's not a, outside of the digital world? Yeah. Uh, it could, uh, yeah, it, for me, that would be one of the main, pro uh, the, the, the main or many problems, yeah? Right. If not the main, yes. As I said yeah. earlier, like for me, I, I, I mean art as a, in a highly individualizing process, mm. or if you want to use Simon Jordan, individuation process, okay? But um, the, uh, if that's the, that's the idea of art, right? If that's the idea, just to, to present things to you, to donate things to you, but where there is an understanding that is definitely me mm. that is giving you. And I want to sympathize. Something that resonates with me will resonate with you. I don't, the, the thing is that, that I don't want to be saying that we cannot do art with the digital. I know it seems that I'm saying that, OK? <laughs> but I'm simply saying, what kind of art, uh, what, what is a digital art? But yes, uh, authenticity well, I mean, is one of the problems. Because I see yeah. personality in different people's works just because it's within the digital space doesn't mean it, it, it doesn't have signature or agency. Tell Even that to the art galleries to go back. That's one of the main problem for, um, uh, one of the main problem for, uh, one of the main reasons, sorry, why uh, digital art does not have a market as traditional art. Mm. Because galleries can, do not know uh, how make a digital artifact mm. Uh, to put a signature on it. Yeah. So, uh, uh, an but, but isn't, that, isn't that more to do with commercial values rather than the thing in itself? Yeah, in that case, I'm, I'm stressing that, yeah, I'm just making a point. But there is uh, actually uh, an, an, an interesting historical uh, 
uh, account like about uh, net art, right? You, you're familiar with net art, the movement in the 90s about websites. And, um, the, what's his name? Um, ah, anyway, one of the main proponents like uh, Alex Shulgin and or Li, uh, Li, Liliana, or Liana Olina or um, Vusik. Vusik, Vusic. Um, so Vusic, the, his famous work uh, about um, uh, ASCII art, right, uh, with porno pornographic imagery. I think in the end, because yes, at the beginning in the 90s, net art was anti-establishment, anti-gallery, anti-this, anti-that. Eh? Where, where do you find them now? In the MoMA <laughs> Museum, right? But how do, they, how do they manage to commercialize their art? Well, eventually, I think, uh, Vucic just give the floppy disk, sign it, and say, yeah, this is, this is the original one. The gallery was happy, and they sold it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. So I guess I wanted to maybe back to questions of history and time. Like, I'll let I, you respond, Robin, because... It, I, I talk too much. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, okay. no, whichever is, it, it's yeah. hard to bother you because you were on about, well, our idea of the post-digital uh, is gone if we don't have a concept of digital. But uh, is a difference between you that, Giuseppe, you, you think there, there is a pre-digital world and there was a time and an event uh, that then the, the digital arises in the world, whereas, Robin, would you say like the digital is that there, there's no such thing as a, like a a pre-digital world. Um, that, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting way to look at it. Um, yeah, like how, yeah, how does the digital arise in the world? Um, yeah. I think, yeah, it would take longer than we have. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, as always, right? It would always take longer than we have. Um, some, something I've been looking at is, is uh, a, a, a Thomasist theories of sound. So light, we're used to thinking about, you know, from physics as being either a particle or a wave and you consider it as one or the other basically for convenience for the problem you're trying to solve, essentially. Um, and sometimes it acts as one or the other. But when it comes to sound, we always think of sound as a wave that travels from me speaking to you. That's actually only true in a very abstract way, in the sense that it's a pressure wave, so there's no one atom or molecule of air that's traveling from me to you. It's an energy transfer through discrete molecules or atoms, which this represents. Um, and so I think there's, there has been a history of atomicist theories of sound, but they've been very obscure. It's one of these sort of, science is not just one monolithic thing, there's, there's a lot of suppressed science. And where it really came out and was actually in electronic music, uh, Zanakis, the famous composer, who came up with this technique of granular synthesis that was based explicitly on Greek philosophers, Epicurus, Lucretius, and so on, that had atomicist ideas about the world, that it was made up of discrete, ele discrete elements like this. This was actually shot many years ago in a lab here at UCC, actually, um, that I got access to. Um, there's a pile of junk in one corner, in including these out-of-date models of the molecule of something, carbon, probably. Um, so anyway. There, there is this history, an alternate history of, say, the science of sound even, that leads to us thinking about it in a very, very different way. And it, for me, it avoids some of these issues around gaps as being voids. It avoids the voids. Uh, I don't see that the gaps are, are a negative thing. They're a space in which life can happen. You know, they're a space in which particles move in their fields and that fields move in interaction with each other. And I, always, I find, I f whenever I read those ancient Greek philosophers or some of the newer people who've based their thinking on them, I'm always filled with more optimism than pessimism about what we can do and about the different models that we can apply to the world. So I just wanted to get that out there, even if it doesn't quite answer your question. I, I'd like to thank the organizers and yeah. everyone who spoke earlier. I can't believe that we're still able to speak cogently after this many, <laughs> after this many presenters, but it's I, been a fantastic that, day. Yeah. Thank you all, yeah, fantastic. <laughs>